Hello and welcome to another edition of Todd Talk, where we take teaching theory and turn it into teaching practice. So, so far in our theme month of challenging kids with higher level questioning, we've talked about how you raise the rigor, and then we've looked at how you can look at the standard itself to determine what level of thinking students need to be learning that particular standard at. So now that we have that under our belt, what we need to do is to write questions or to ask questions that are higher level uh, when it's appropriate. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in today's Todd Talk. Why should you use higher level questioning? So there are a couple of arguments here. One is that questioning is doesn't take any you know programming. It doesn't take any you know you don't have to buy anything. You can simply control the questioning as the educator yourself. So you can ask the types of questions you want to ask just by writing those questions or asking those questions. Um, Higher level questioning tends to lead to better student understanding. When you ask a student a question at a lower level, they just memorize it or understand it. But when you ask them to analyze and create, then they have to think about it at a whole different level. And so because they're thinking more, they're going to retain it more because they've thought deeper about it. If you ask th thoughtful, higher level questions, it's going to promote critical thinking um, as well as problem solving as well as creativity and other 21st century skills that you want your students to possess um, in the classroom. And so that it, it just naturally leads to those things. And then lastly, you can use higher level questioning to differentiate with every student. So you can ask, you don't have to just high, ask higher level questions of the gifted students. You could ask it of the regular ed students, special ed students. You can ask lower level questions to the, the gifted students. So you figure out where your students are at and then you can scaffold the question accordingly. So I might ask one question to one student and then ask the exact same content of the question in a different question to another student that is at a different level because that student has shown that they're able to either handle that or they need to be scaffolded up to it. And I've talked about this in another talk talk, but when I'm writing high level questions, I personally like to use the idea of blooms. And the reason why is blooms is divided into two sections. So you have your lower level thinking. So if you ask an app, app, app applying question, then you're asking students to think at a lower level of thinking. But I know that if I ask an evaluating question, I, I'm raising the rigor and I'm asking them to think at higher levels. And so it allows me to, you know, to make a dis clear distinction between the lower level and higher level using this as kind of to categorize these questions. And so lower level questions, as you know, are, are the remembering and understanding and applying, but you have to ask yourself what percentage of the questions you're asking fall into this. Because what I tend to find um, when I'm observing in classrooms is most of the questions from the assessments to the day-to-day -day activities to the questions um, they're verbally asking fall into lower level questions. They're just asking students to think at a lower level. So there's nothing wrong with asking lower level questions, by the way. So I'm not saying you do all higher level questions. What I'm suggesting is that it needs to be 50-50. You need to have um, you know, equal amount of lower level and higher level ones because the lower level are the building blocks. So you can't analyze unless you understand something. You can't create something unless you're able to remember what it is that you're creating. And so these act as the foundation of the building blocks of these higher level questions. But you have to put in you have to remember that these lower level questions are just the beginning. You don't want to stop there. If you want to raise the rigor in your classroom, then you have to start asking those higher level questions. And so the higher level questions fall under the analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And this is really where the depth of learning takes place for students. This is when they're going to be getting a, a much deeper understanding of something because they tend to be more open ended and there's no ceiling on them. They have to think about them critically. They have to try to bring their own lives into it, our own opinions, our own thoughts into it. And so by making those connections, they're able to, you know, retain it because they're they're thinking about it on a different level. Um, the, the keep in mind, we talked about this before when we talked about um, the difference between rigor and hard. Just because you make a question really complex does not mean they're using the thinking level um, of these top blooms. Uh, other than the Bloom's chart. So you have to make sure that the question you're asking is asking them to do the action of the higher level thinking. Um, I like higher level questions most of all because 
I think a lot of times we learn in the, the vacuum of a classroom. So we learn something, but we don't know how it works in our lives or in the real world. Um, and I, a higher level questioning allows students to kind of make that connection and to see the context of what it is that they're learning so they can see the big picture. So the, re uh, the reason why I really like to use balloons is because there tends to be certain verbs that are associated with different levels of balloons. So if I'm asking students to understand something, I might ask them to, and when I'm writing my questions or asking my questions, I may ask them to explain something, or I may ask them to describe something. Um, and so those types of questions are just going to be the lower level types of questions. And the verb kind of indicates what level of thinking students are going to be doing. But if I want to raise the rigor and ask students to analyze the thinking, then I may ask them to compare and contrast something. I may ask them to, you know, examine something a little more deeper. I may ask them to, you know, validate why they chose this particular answer. And so they're having to analyze. Similarly, if I'm asking them to evaluate, I may ask them to criticize or debate something, or I may ask them to justify. Um, and so the verbs, now keep in mind that just because you put the verb in there doesn't make it that level of thinking, but these are kind of clues as to how you can write questions at these different these various levels by using these verbs and you can find a charts like this online very easily um, but this is one that i like to use because it has has a lot of them and so by using these verbs you could scaffold the question so you can start your unit with uh, remembering and understanding questions so that you can see the students are building a base um, or a foundation for an understanding. But once students get there, you can start to move it up. You can ask them to apply it, you can ask them to analyze it, until eventually, by the end of the unit of learning, students are creating and evaluating. They're thinking at higher levels so that they get that understanding at, at a deeper level. And so by doing this, uh, using these verbs and scaffolding the questions with the verbs, you can change a question from lower level to higher level. So here's an example. In language arts, if you ask someone to describe the theme of the book, they're simply showing you an understanding, or they may be applying. But if you ask them to change the theme of the book, then they're creating. Then they're having to, to, to come and to think of, bring their own opinions and their own criteria into that in order to be able to accomplish that task. Um, when it comes to math, if you ask them to solve an equation, then they're simply applying. They're simply just you know using the concept of math to find a correct answer. But if you ask them to modify the equation, so they're having you, you're changing it here or there, and then giving a criteria for why they're doing that, then they might be analyzing, you know, why it is that they made these move, these different changes that they did. When it comes to science, if they explain how a chemical change works, they're simply, you know, showing you that they have an understanding of how chemical change works. But if you ask them to validate, so to justify, to make an argument for why, then again, they're having to use that um, evaluating, you know, level of thinking where they're thinking again at a higher level. For social studies, if they simply were to name three reasons the colonists won the American Revolution, this is this is just remembering. So they read this somewhere, they heard this somewhere, and they're, they're, they're reciting it back to you, remembering what it is they learned, and they're putting that down. But if you ask them to rank three reasons the colonists won, where they have to say, this is the most important, this is you know important but not as important so they're having to think about a criteria for these different events and to having to justify to evaluate and to defend these different then that's that's a different level of thinking going on and so if you were to scaffold blooms using a, a simple story that we all know goldilocks and the three bears this is what this might look like so at the beginning of the unit you might have students remembering by asking them a question of what are items goldilocks used while she was in the bear's house so you read the, the story to them, you ask them to remember there was a chair, there was a bed, there was a porridge and all that good stuff. If you ask them to understand um, as you get further along, you may ask them to explain to you why Goldilocks liked baby bear's chair the best. So again, it's in the story, but it's not as obviously in the story. You have to, you have to read between the lines a tiny bit, but there's definitely you know many clues that she picks what she picks because it's just right. Um, and there, but there might be different reasons why she picked the chair as being just right as, as the porridge, because the chair is comfortable while the porridge is the right temperature. So the students would have to make a distinction there, but it's still lower level thinking. When it comes to applying, you may ask, what would Goldilocks use if she came to your house? And so students are having to think, I always call application the higher lower level question because students do have to apply to a situation which may not have been used before. But they're still using the same criteria. So when she came to the bear's house, she was looking for food, um, comfort, and sleep. And so when they come to, 
to, to the, your house, they're going to be doing the exact same thing. So they're going to be, but you may not use porridge. You may use pizza because you don't have porridge in your house. Or instead of, you know, a bed, they may sleep on the futon down the basement. So, but it's still applying the same concepts. Once you get further in, you can ask students to analyze. So you can ask them to compare the Goldilocks and the Three Bears to reality. What events could and could not happen. And so they have to, you know, putting aside the fact that bears are living in a house and talking, you know, there are things that such as, would a girl be out in the woods like that? Or, you know, would the porridge be at different levels if it were cooked the same from the same pot? Why would it make a difference between the, the heat of the different porridge? So students could definitely have a lot to a lot to work with, a lot to play with, a lot of open-endedness with that analyzing. For evaluating, you're asking students, you could ask students to judge whether Goldilocks was right for entering the bear's house. I mean, in in, in, in the real world, that's breaking and entering. But it becomes this ethical question of if you're lost in the woods and you're hungry and you're cold and you're starving, are you justified in, in breaking into someone's house? That could be a very interesting conversation that you could have with students. And then lastly, if you're asking them to create, they they have to imagine how the story would change if the, if the story was told from the perspective of the bears. And so even though the elements of the story might be similar, you're looking at it from another person's perspective. So they're seeing Goldilocks as maybe as, as an enemy as opposed to the sweet girl as it's as posed in the beginning because they, she has broken into their house and stolen some of their stuff. Um, but at the same time, you know, they, you know, maybe, maybe they'd be more empathetic and you just don't know because you're not in the, the head of the bears, but by creating this, you can get a whole new perspective and a whole new kind of look on the same story. So I like to use stems when I'm writing. So not only using the verbs themselves, but stems to help me. So if I'm asking analyzing questions, I may say, how is blank related to blank? So when I'm using the content of what it is that I'm teaching, and I'm just kind of filling it in to this particular stem, and this, this is asking questions at the analyzing level. Or if I were to ask students, um, what do you see as other possible outcomes? Um, so again, the, I'm asking that, I mean, that's probably a follow-up question to a, a lower level question of what was the outcome? And then I could ask, what do you see as other possible outcomes? And so students are having to take it to, to raise the rigor to think about it at a different level. So those are stems that you could use for analyzing to just help you write assessments or to ask questions in your classroom. If you're asking evaluating questions, you might say, what did you think about? And because they're, they're giving their opinion and this is evaluating, but they have to justify that. Or if you ask about how would you feel if, and this is making it metacognitive. And so students are, again, seeing that big picture of how this fits into things. So those are evaluating stems that you might use in, in general questions. When it comes to creating, you might ask, you know, you know, could you see a possible solution? And then they have to, you know, try to come up with a solution to something that doesn't have an obvious answer. So that can you see a possible solution could be used at the lower level as if there's a definitive answer. But if it's not a definitive answer, like if you ask them, do you see a possible solution to world peace? There is no one answer and st students would have to, to create an idea of what that might look like. Or if you ask students, how many ways can you think about something? And so students are having to think of at lots, not just one way, but several different ways. And so again, that level of thinking has been, has been raised. You can sp um, have specific stems to ELA. So here are some ELA stems right here that you could use when writing your assessments or, or asking your questions. Um, and so you see some there, you know, what is the motive there? So it may not have been, um, you know, explicitly stated, but you have to, you know, it's, it's um, you have to infer, you have to read between the lines, you have to really analyze the, the book in order to be able to tell that. Or how is blank similar to blank? And so students are having to, again, if you're saying, how is the situation with this particular character similar to this situation in real life? And then you're linking those things together. So here are evaluating ELA stems. So do you agree with the actions of? So you have to justify whether you agree with the actions of the character. So if you're looking at Huck Finn, was he right to run away from his home? Um, and you could you can make an argument for either side. Um, or if you were to say, how would you convince someone to read this book? So you're trying to you know, give a critique of this book and, and show them why someone should be reading that. So those are evaluating ELA stems. For creating, you could, how can you rewrite the ending of the story? So a real simple one where they're having to, to create a whole new thing, but they, they do have to still use the, 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 the logic and the clues from the book. They can't just like all of a sudden put it into outer space if the setting was, you know, the 1800s and, you know, uh, in, in a Puritan village. So, um, if you ask them to draw a picture about the story, 
um, where it's not blatantly put there, but they, you ha when you're reading the book, you know, students have to envision what these scenes and sets look like if they're not explicitly stated. So students may draw a picture about that in order to show that. Math has, it, it can be tough to write higher level questions, but here's some stems for math. You know, what is the function of, and then they have to explain how it was used in the problem, not just solving the problem, but how it was used. Or discuss the pros and cons of using this particular method of solving the problem. So are there better ways to do it? Are there different ways to do it? Is one better than another? So that would be analyzing in, so math for math. When it comes to evaluating, you would ask them to, what are the chances of, and students would have to come up with a criteria for what they think the chances of this happening are. Um, or if they were to say, you know, judge the value of. So if students do a problem a certain way, again, they're having to determine, you know, was this the best way to do it? You know, is there a better way to do it? Or once you get the answer, you're, you're judging the value. So if you're asking them a real world math question where they're having to determine how much money was spent on something, and then they have to determine, well, what was that enough? Was that not enough? Was it appropriate? And so on and so forth. So they're thinking at higher levels. When it comes to creating, um, this could be students formulating theory themselves. So they're having to create the equation themselves, or they're having to create the math problem themselves, or asking them how they would improve. So how could they take a math problem and come up with a more efficient way to answer it, or a better way to ask that question uh, in order to learn that concept? So those are some creating math stems that you can use there. And so I like to use these stems when I'm writing my assessments so that I can ensure that I'm asking questions at the, both the lower level and the higher level. And so when I write my assessments, I usually have um, three questions for many of my final assessments. And the first one is the lower level. The second one is kind of a mid-level thinking, so it's an application analyzing. And then my final one will be the higher level of evaluating and creating. And so I've scaffolded my assessments and then let students kind of warm up to get to that the higher level of thinking. So that is how you can ask higher level questions on your assessments and your day-to-day -day practice. But it's really important that you have the awareness of the types of questions you're already asking. You can take many of your lower level questions that you ask in your class and modify them to higher level questions by changing the verb or changing the stem. And so you don't have to totally recreate your classroom if you determine I'm not asking enough higher level questions. And so it's important that you have this awareness of what types of questions you are asking them and whether this needs to be improved or not.